This Thanks. meeting is being recorded. Oops, that's a new one. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. And just to let you know, this meeting is being recorded. If you want to ask questions and you're not comfortable about being shown on the video or the, the playback, please ask questions during the chat. You can always email us at any time. Next slide, please. So the agenda is we've got our data update presented by Steve Turnbull. George Butler will be giving us an update on the guidance and some new communications. Then we'll have Lisa Chandler telling us a little bit more about the pulse oximetry service and Dasha with a vaccine update. Now I know we've only usually got 30 minutes and we've got quite a lot today, so we probably will um, go over. So I apologize already, but there's a lot to share with you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so over to you, thank you, Steve. Okay, uh, I'll try, <coughs> excuse me, I'll try and take uh, us through the data update fairly quickly so we've got time for some questions. Uh, but it's been uh, a lot has changed since the, the last time uh, I was here. So if we just move to the next slide, please. Uh, so <coughs> what, what's happened since, uh, since pre Christmas? We knew this was going to happen. Uh, We've been talking about Omicron building. Uh, and and it's uh, it, it built up beneath our level of Delta. So we had Delta variant, and they're, they're the same virus, but just different strains in, in a way. So uh, so Delta had been uh, with us for a while and had been giving us quite high levels of infection. Uh, and that was masking the fact that Omicron was building in the background. And then all of a sudden, it, it, Omicron takes over. Uh, and in the last, uh, in the seven days up to the 4th of January, which is... Uh, Obviously, that's uh, a week or so ago now. Anyway, uh, over eight thousand people have tested positive. To put it to put that another way, that's pretty much one person every minute uh, in Wakefield District has been getting infected. So it is extraordinarily transmissible and is driving a huge amount of infections. So roughly one in forty people, and I guess most people on the call will know people who have been infected. If they're not being infected themselves, everybody knows somebody uh, now, uh, and. And those figures don't include reinfections. And one of the reasons why Omicron is so successful is that it can uh, it can bypass our defences. So it can bypass your immunity um, to some degree, not entirely, but it can bypass your immunity if you've been uh, vaccinated by two doses. Three doses uh, is is much better. Uh, and if you've been if you had COVID before, it can reinfect you. Uh, so it, it's very good at doing that. But those um, reinfections or those uh, people who are being infected despite having the vaccinations, that tends to be mild uh, disease because you still have some protection for, from that. Uh, the other thing that we often hear is, well, everybody's tested, so you're going to find more uh, more out there. But actually, what uh, the way we might measure that is what's called positivity. So what proportion of tests come back positive? Normal times, so kind of like December time, uh, we were running around 10 to 15 percent of all our cases uh, were all our tests were coming back positive. Now it's over 50 percent. So that's it's not just about doing more testing. This is genuinely more disease, uh, more infections out there. Uh, and you can see there are some figures that we've got. You know, probably around 28,000 people at any one point infected by uh, by by the the virus. Uh, that has started to trickle into uh, hospital admissions, but not not hugely as yet. And staff absences are, are, are the the real point of, of pressure at the minute across all services. Uh, wherever you work, you'll probably find lots of people absent. Uh, it, it, the figure there, 714, it got worse, but now it's improved. So there's now uh, they're starting to improve a little bit in the in the hospital. So can you move on to the next slide, please, Hannah. Uh, and you can see you can see this. Well, when when you do any statistics work, you're told that you can easily easily misinterpret guide by uh, charts by changing the axes and and it, it makes things look. So we left the axes the same as we've always used, and you can see the line goes off the top of the chart. Uh, it's an extraordinary level. Our previous high was 750. And if you move on to the next slide, please, you can see the top of the chart. Uh, our rates have gone over. Uh, over roughly around 2,200. It looks like we've gone a little bit higher than that to around 2,600, uh, which is an extraordinary level of infection. But the most recent data, which is not on here, 
suggest that might be slowing down a little bit, but it's very early to say because there's, there's still uh, there's still pl places that uh, are still going upwards. So we we know that, for example, Middlesbrough uh, is now over three thousand. So it, it could it could continue, but we've got we've the first signal that it might be starting to slow down a little. So we'll we'll just have to monitor that for now. And if you move uh, on to the next slide, please. Uh, this shows the the pattern uh, for. Uh, for West Yorkshire, I, it's hard to tell, but everybody's in the pretty much the same boat. Wakefield's currently the highest, um, but hopefully will come down soon. What, when you've got a, a variant as transmissible as Omicron, it tends to go up very quickly, but hopefully it will come down very quickly. Uh, and if you move to the next slide, please. Uh, skip past that. I mentioned that that's our positivity rate, which are, uh, as you can see, are going very high. So if you move on uh, to the next screen, Hannah. Uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, you can see then again we we have. Uh, you can see that we've not only increased positivity, but we have increased. Lots of people are doing tests, and may, a lot of those are uh, now LFT testing. Uh, and there is a change in guidance that came into place yesterday that you no longer need to do a confirmatory PCR test if you've tested positive on LFT. The important thing in there is if you've got symptoms, go straight to PCR, uh, as, as always. Don't rely on LFTs for, for that. But if you're just doing a, a, a regular check or you're going to go and visit somebody or go to an event and you want to check, first of all, and you do an LFT, if that's positive, report that on the national system. Uh, you don't need to get a PCR test because there's so much of it about we can uh, be reassured that that's a genuinely positive test and you can take action at that point. Uh, so that that's guidance that changed uh, just came into place yesterday. And if you move on to the next slide, please. Uh, by age range, I mean, these are testing rates, so I'm, I'm not too worried about spending time on those. But if you just skip on to the next slide, please. Uh, and, and again, we're seeing the same kind of pattern as, as we've seen often, that our testing rates are lower in our more deprived communities and higher in our most affluent communities, which is um, it, it is quite wide at the minute. You can see at one point back in December, it was quite a narrow gap. Now it's widened. Uh, and we do worry that this the Omicron uh, wave is actually changing people's testing behaviors as well as well as the fact that testing is under pressure so you sometimes get delays in getting your own results back and if we move on one more please this is a slide it's probably difficult to see uh, but you can see the darker areas show the higher levels of infection and every age group is, is now a, a affected but just to sh uh, pull some of the numbers out the highest age range by infection currently is 19 to 24 year olds. And when a new variant comes into town, it often starts at that age range because that's the age range that are more mobile, the more likely to be socializing and out with, uh, with, with friends and, and in lots of different settings. So we often see it start there and we've got rates of, in the 19 to 24 year olds of over three and a half thousand. What worries us is that then expands into other age ranges. And uh, we've now got uh, case rates in the 60 to 80 year olds, uh, over a thousand and, and higher rates uh, in, in every area. Schools have gone back. So the, the, the sudden increase uh, happened before schools went back. We've, we've got high rates in schools already, but we will need to watch this and see how it progresses now. Schools have been back a, a week or so. And we are starting to see increases in, in school age children as well, which is to be expected. Um, but obviously we're more worried about the older elderly because that is more likely to have a uh, need for some extra uh, support uh, if you have a, a bad experience of COVID. Uh, we must be nearly the end of the slides. Uh, can we move on one, one more, Hannah? Uh, yeah, and that's the same information, just given slightly differently. And that's showing the, uh, the older age ranges, which is the one that we, we want to be uh, mindful of because they may trigger some more hospital pressures uh, and social care pressures. Uh, one more slide, please, Anna. Uh, and that's the other age ranges, which again, you see every, you can see the, the, the school age, the, the blue and yellow line starting to, to increase as well, which we will be monitoring, uh, as we go through the next week or two. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, they're just going through all the, and that's the, you can see the, the working age population, particularly driven at, at early doors by the 90 to 24 year olds, which have now gone over 4,000 by the looks of that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. It's probably safe to say that, as you would imagine, this is this is everywhere. Uh, if we move on uh, to one slide, there's not one part of the district that's uh, that's having a worse time. Every, it's pretty much in every part of the district, uh, and even those areas that you can see there in in the lighter colours, uh, they're still at significantly high rates uh, and will fluctuate rapidly. Uh, move on, one more, please, Hannah. Long COVID, I mean, this is interesting. We don't, um, we can see, obviously, the more cases we get, then um, we often worry about hospital pressures. And uh, that's in the, the short term. But let's not forget that, that this is not, even though this has been experienced milder, this can have implications longer uh, and longer term. So we, we do really need to keep on uh, uh, helping people to access long COVID support if they're experiencing symptoms for uh, beyond their acute infection phase, because that's uh, really important and not something we fully understand uh, as yet. So that's something for us all to just not to not to forget that high levels of infection may not lead to huge amounts of people in hospital, but it will still have implications for, for uh, everybody's health. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, hospital uh, admissions, and you can see that we've we've now started to see an increase, and we've now got more people in hospital than since back in last year, back in March. So you can start to see that this is starting to build, and we know that infections, the rise in infections starts, and then a few weeks later, then you have uh, rises in admissions. Uh, now, hopefully that seems to be well managed at the minute in hospitals uh, and having some staff back is helping. But clearly that's going to be a challenging time for both our health and social care over the next few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we haven't seen yet, and again, we know that cases uh, end up uh, weeks later leading into more admissions. And then further down the line, unfortunately, uh, uh, deaths may increase. We've not seen that yet, but that's not to say it won't happen. Uh, hopefully, we've got better treatments uh, and, and better systems, so hopefully we won't see a big uptick in, in deaths. But as you can see, we've been having, uh, you know, we've not had a week without a COVID death for, for several months now. Uh, so this is by no means uh, over at the minute, but let's hope that that doesn't increase uh, too much over the next few weeks. Uh, that may well be the last slide, I think. I'm guessing. Oh, no, sorry, vaccinations. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, you can see the figures there. I'm, I'm sure Darcy will, will, will have some more up-to-date information. But but I think the general message is the booster campaign has done really well. Uh, very good uh, coverage, uh, which is really uh, which is really good to see. Uh, and we need to keep on uh, pushing that. The boost is important, but the first vaccination for anybody who's not being vaccinated that's equally important uh, as well. So uh, they, it does make a big difference to to uh, your experience of, of COVID. If you get infected and you've had your booster, you're likely to have a much milder uh, uh, experience of the illness, which is which is obviously very very important. So I can't overestimate how important vaccinations are currently. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a way of trying to uh, demonstrate how fast um, the variance has changed. So the, you can see the original uh, back in March 2020. I mean, actually, this goes back to August 2020 when we had uh, some testing. But Alpha took over. That was the Kent variant that we discovered in Kent. Took several months before it, it became dominant, really. Delta, uh, you can see Delta took over from Alpha in probably about a month or so. But Omicron has taken over within a space of weeks. Now, that's that's why we've got such extraordinarily high rates. But the good thing about this is it's pushed Delta uh, away to almost nothing. So hopefully Omicron will go away as quickly as it came. And if it does so, then we think at the minute that Omicron will give you um, immunity from Delta. So if you've been infected by Omicron, and pretty much anybody who's infected now is infected by Omicron, then you're not going to be, you'll probably have good immunity from Delta. So when it goes away, it hopefully will take Delta away with it, which might give us a, a better 
a better uh, spring time. Uh, so let, let's cross our fingers on that one. They never say never with COVID. It's too <laughs> surprising. But at least we've, we've got something that seems to have uh, pushed Delta off its perch, which is quite useful. Uh, I'm hoping that may well be the last slide. <laughs> and we've got time for questions. Yep, there you go. <laughs> uh, I may have missed some in the chat, so it's... Uh... Thank you very much, Steve. We do have a question from Joe in the chat. Are the people who are hospitalised unvaccinated or are people still being admitted that are vaccinated? OK, uh, it's a difficult question to, to answer in, in a way uh, because there's a difference between uh, the rates of people being admitted and the numbers. So uh, what we've got is the, the majority of the population are vaccinated, either double vaccinated or, or boosted. Uh, and they are less. You are less likely to go into hospital if you are fully vaccinated, especially if you're boosted uh, as well. That that reduces your risk. But because there's so many people who are uh, being boosted, then uh, you may you may have a less chance. But there's a lot of them, so they they may look like there's more of them in hospital. But actually, it, it's about risk uh, and rates of risk. So you know, it, it can be that somebody could be admitted even though they've been vaccinated. But you're far less likely to uh, be um, in hospital if you're vaccinated, and far less likely to, um, to need um, any mechanical ventilation or intensive care if you are if you are fully vaccinated and boosters. Thank you very much. We've got another question: Is there any information as to whether the 45k unvaccinated are a particular sector of the population? Uh, yeah, good, good question. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, when we look at vaccination coverage, it's important to look at the whole population. And, and mm. at the minute, we're not vaccinating the youngest children. So, you know, most of you've got to take out the, uh, all the, the younger children uh, currently. Uh, and then there are, there are always pockets uh, of, of people who, who uh, choose not to get vaccinated. And we have particular uh, pockets in uh, central Wakefield areas, uh, which we we have a, a big list. We have a list of all the, the people who are unvaccinated and we're trying to work through. Uh, we have a, a system where we can give them direct phone calls uh, and try and uh, help them to uh, understand why they may be reticent. So some people are actively pro uh, anti-vaccine uh, vaccines. Some people are just uh, not got round to it yet. Not got, you know, a little bit unsure of how to do it, uh, and and that's what we we're finding. We're finding actually, from what I heard uh, from uh, this morning, was uh, we've had a a, a good uptick uh, from New Year uh, when people have had the first vaccine. So maybe it was a New Year's resolution, which would would, would be great if if that that turned out to the case. So it, it's there's always little pockets, uh, but no, there's no a particular sector of the population. It, it's it's quite a, a Apart from that ge ge geography that I mentioned, it's, uh, that's the main issue, I, I would suspect. That's great. Thank you very much, Steve. If there are any more questions, people can always email or put them questions on WhatsApp. But I'm just very conscious of the time and we've still got a lot to rattle through. So thank you ever so much for that update. Grim looking, but uh, there we are. I uh, think um, what we've got next slide, please, Hannah. I'm just trying to remember who was next on the agenda. I think this is George. We've got George Butler from our communications team. Over to you, George. So this is our new asset to go with uh, getting tested. We rejigged the caption slightly. So uh, next slide. This is the uh, new information regarding um, lateral flow tests. There's a very high demand at the moment for lateral flow tests. So um, the best thing to do is to go to the government website and arrange for home delivery. Uh, there are 900,000 slots a day available. So if you go at any particular time, there's no availability. It's best to just, just drive back uh, an hour or two later. They, they are released in segments, so they will be available across the day. So this, this is the information on how you can uh, obtain them. If you go to Twitter and type in at LFT underscore alert, it will let you know when they are actually going to be released and available so you can obtain them that way. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a couple of the uh, social media posts, one for Facebook and one for Twitter that we've put out with regards to that, if you're wanting to share those on your, on your, on your uh, platforms. 
Uh, next slide. This is um, the current government uh, asset, uh, one of the current government assets that we're using for boosters. Uh, they've updated it slightly with the Omicron information there. Uh, th those are, you can use those on your platform. So next slide. And uh, this, this is the government uh, messaging on boosters um, that a booster is necessary because two doses don't give you the full protection uh, from Omicron and you can still become infected and, and catch COVID uh, if, you don't have, if you don't have the booster. So it's really promoting that everyone should um, get the booster as soon as possible, as soon as they become eligible. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, this is the uh, government asset on self-isolation. So the rules have changed on self-isolation that um, Steve uh, sort of mentioned in his presentation. So uh, next slide. So. Sorry, George, I slipped a bit of extra information on there. That's why you're looking surprised. <laughs> okay. Uh, Right. Uh, where's where's the information that I I sent through? Sorry. That's the bit at the top. The test of positive. Your Twitter right. feed. Is is that all I sent? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So th basically, the the rules have changed in terms of um, your self isolation period. So this this applies whether or whether you're vaccinated or not. If you um, if you catch COVID. Um, the advice is to test yourself with a lateral flow test from day six. If it's if it's negative on day six and you take a further test on day seven, 24 hours later, you can leave self-isolation. Now, if you test te if you test positive on day six, keep on taking tests every 24 hours. And as soon as you've received two negative tests, you can then leave self-isolation. So you can leave earlier than the 10 days. But it is, it is advised that you limit your contact with people um, until, until you feel that 10 days, uh, close contact and contacting in close spaces because you could still be, uh, you could still be infectious. But um, as long as you don't have a high temperature and you test negative, you can leave self-isolation. Okay, that's, that's everything from me. Thank you very much, George. And can we just go back, Hannah, please, to the to the one above? And we've just put in there for your information about where PCR testing um, is available at the following locations. Um, obviously, that's sent out to you with the um, slides. Next slide, please, Hannah. Thank you. Have we got Lisa on the call? We have got a Lisa, but I'm not sure if it's Lisa Chandler. Are you with us, Lisa? Yep, I'm here. I haven't got a slide. Marvellous. Camera on though. Uh, is that all right? <laughs> I've got the camera on. Can you see me? There Hello. you are. Hello, Lisa. Lovely to see you. Hello. Nice to see you. And um, so, I'm literally here just to sort of um, follow up on uh, the couple of times I've been before. So I haven't bought slides again because I thought you've seen them all. Um, but what I have just come to do is just to to remind remark remind people about these these two services. So the first thing I want to just remind you about is the um, the oxygen meters that you can get for use at home. So if someone has um, an acute infection of COVID and they have any risk factors, like they're over 65, they're, um, they're obese, they have diabetes, they have some learning disabilities like Down syndrome or... Um, or there are other reasons that you'd be concerned about them, such as, a, such as a learning disability or living alone, those sorts of things. They can get a little meter at home that will help to keep them safe. So as I've, I've been before, and apologies to say it all again, but um, one of the things with, with, with COVID is that your oxygen levels can be quite low before you notice them, uh, notice that they've gone down. You don't feel poorly, you don't feel unwell, um, but your oxygen levels in your blood have dropped. Now, if you had a normal chest infection, like your COPD was playing you up or you had a, a bronchitis or, or, or with asthma even, an exacerbation of asthma, if oxygen levels in your blood start to drop, you know about it. You feel breathless 
And if I was to, 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 to look at you as a nurse and I could tell straight away that you were having problems with your breathing. There, there's all sorts of complicated reasons why uh, for someone with COVID, this doesn't happen. And some people, particularly those who are really vulnerable from an infection, will find that um, their levels, oxygen levels drop and they just don't know it and nobody around them can tell. We've recently added people who aren't vaccinated uh, to the list of people we consider to be vulnerable and are likely to have problems simply because of the thing that Steve said earlier um, in that while there are less people um, who haven't been vaccinated, the risk in that group is greater. So we're offering the meters out to those as well. Each day the service gets a list of people who um, have tested positive that day and what they will do is they will contact those people seem to be at higher risk from that list with a, a text message and ask them to come back to them. But what we're finding is in some areas, some groups of the population, we're not hearing back from them. So we don't know if that's because they don't trust the text message or they're, they're a bit worried about getting a text message from somebody. Um, so really, we just want them to try and get the message out that you might get a text message if you do. Please respond to it and, and we can get you a little meter out and someone will tell you how to do it. You don't have to have lots of calls and things. They'll just drop it off at your house and you can do it yourself um, or you can get some help if you need it. Um, and if you do get the message and you, you, do, you feel fine and you don't want to bother and no, I don't want one. And then you're told if you change your mind at any point, just ring your GP and ask them to get you one and they'll put you in touch with the with the service. So it's really just that reminder that the service is there and just to get it in people's heads again so that um, at the moment we just we tend to get uh, white British in better off areas coming forward and having the service when we really want to make sure that we're not missing anyone out. We've sent information out to some of the faith leaders recently and to, to other, other groups and I can, I've sent that information on to, to Tracy and she can send that out to people if, if, if she thinks it will help just as that sort of reminder um about what we're talking about but it is you know if you get a message please please you know uh accept the offer so um that's the first part and the second part again is just following up on something that steve said again so the boss has been and he's, he's, he's said he's, he's mentioned things that helped me with a lead in so long covid um we are expecting more and more people to be affected past sort of what you might expect is a normal recovery time from a virus. So anything that's going on for four to 12 weeks, um, we really want you to discuss with your GP. Any, any scary symptoms like chest pains and things, I'm sure people would go along or increase in breathlessness, I'm sure people would go along with. But that tiredness and not sleep and maybe even things like anxiety or weird rashes, we would want you to talk to your GP about it and there's, um, there's things that can be done to help. But also, if you were, um, if you are continuing to have symptoms past that 12 weeks, again, we really, really want you to go to, to see your GP or to access some support. And we've got links again of the different places like Live Well Wakefield, where people can go and get support themselves. But ideally, you know, talk to your GP and see if there, there is something that needs some proper support. Now, I've spoken to someone recently who says they have trouble swallowing. You can't sort that out yourself. You need some help with that. Um, I've got someone I was talking to yesterday telling me that their husband is still breathless. Um, and, and, and that's sort of eight weeks after. So he's going along to the GP to, to see why he might still be being breathless. Chances are he just needs some help around um, building, back, being, building his um, activity levels back up. But, it, you know, we need to get these things checked out. So long COVID, again, we're tending to get people from better off areas. We're tending to get people referred in who, who know a lot about health. And I'm just worried again that we might be missing out some groups of people who perhaps aren't linking the COVID infection they had three months ago or weren't even that poorly with, with the symptoms they're still getting now. So it's about how do we get that message out to people? And any, again, we're, we're trying to get the message out in all sorts of different ways. But again, any, any help from yourself would be amazing and, and brilliant. So that, that's me, really. That was all I had to say. So it weren't a big presentation. Um, but if you do need anything, just, just get in touch and we'll let you have anything you need. That's that fabulous. Right, Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. And we know these pulse oximetry little devices save lives, don't they? They, they have a potential they do, to they save, do save lives. lives. Yeah, there, there, is, there is a reduction in deaths 
in areas who have been using this service. So Absolutely. again, that's why for me it makes it really important that like we don't want anybody to be disadvantaged because they've either not heard of it or don't trust it or, 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 or you know, or, or I'll be all right. My, my dad, you know, my dad's generation is definitely, oh, I'll be fine, just, you know, stop fussing women. But, you know, it's, it is a, that's just aimed at me, by the way, not every, every woman. But yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it is something that we really want to make sure people are aware of and get out to them. Okay. That's fabulous. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks for having uh, me. We've also, <laughs> lovely to see you as well. And we've also had a message. Thank you, Coach uh, Paul, for reminding us there's an indoor testing in South Emsel every Tuesday between 10 and 2 at the Oasis Christian Centre. And it's the same team who are at the market the rest of the week. So thank you for adding that. So next slide, please, Hannah. I think we're over to you now, Dasha. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, this is just a, a reminder and um, colleagues have already mentioned the importance of boosters. So anyone over the age of 18 can book a booster online or we are still running vaccination clinics, walking clinics. Um, on the bottom of the slide, you've got a, a link to information on our CCG website that is being updated very regularly. So it includes all the clinics that are running this week. Um, who they are relating to, who can uh, walk in or where people can book. Um, as you may have heard since the last time we presented information, it has changed to 12-year-olds uh, 12 year, 12 and above who can get their second dose of the Pfizer jab. Um, and again, some of the clinics on our website are noting where 12 and, um, and above can attend. Um, there is a little note around those who have tested uh, uh, positive for COVID recently and the gaps that they need before vaccinations. So just a reminder, given the, uh, the high rate of infection that we are seeing in the district. On the next slide, we just wanted to uh, um, just mention a campaign that is around uh, protecting each other and some of the resources that we have. Um, so you can have a, a look um, at, at, at the website and uh, some more information around keeping well during the winter um, and things that you may wish to, to share within your networks as well. On the last uh, slide, it has just uh, a little bit of a thank you. And that is from the information that uh, my colleague Sue Menzies came to present and we updated around the branding for our Wakefield District Health and Care Partnership, which is how we're going to be operating uh, post uh, July when the Health and Social Care Act comes um, into effect. Um, and we really want to, because people have very kindly uh, submitted their feedback around uh, the design, the concepts and, and the branding generally. We wanted to share that this one, the, uh, blue, green, uh, the blue and green um, logo will be the one we are taking, uh, taking forward. Um, so that was the last slide. I would just like to um, mention, just really to say in terms of the vaccinations, we are really keen to hear and, and see carers coming forward, as well as those who are 18 and above, uh, the young adults. So if you are particularly working or supporting uh, young adults, uh, it will be great. If, if you need any resources, we are more than happy to share resources to really promote the vaccination uptake. Thank you, Tracer. Thank you very much, Dasha. Next slide, please, Hannah. I think this might be the last one. Um, that oh, one, it, 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 it is mine. Uh, it's, <laughs> it is on, on behalf of West Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership. So as we move into the wider West Yorkshire um, side, they are looking to recruit independent non-executive uh, members as part of setting up the integrated care board. And I'm sorry, I'm in, in starting to include a lot of abbreviations and names. But if you are a person who is interested to get involved in um, strategic uh, planning of services, both health and care services across West Yorkshire, um, and you may be um, interested in a non-executive position, this might be for you. Um, and there is a link on the second paragraph for more information. Thank you very much, Dasha. And just to mention that George had put something in the comments earlier to say that he's shared all of his information also on the WhatsApp group, if anybody's interested. It might be easier for them to share from there. Thank you, Dasha. And I think this is the final slide. 
uh, yeah, just a reminder that our next meeting will actually be the 2nd of February. So we're going to have to miss a week because for the first time in about two years, we're going to have a team meeting in our in our team all together. So we won't be available uh, to do the normal COVID champion meeting, but we will be meeting on the 2nd of February and then every two weeks have been scheduled until the end of March. Um, so if anybody's got any questions or comments, please do send them in to me. I think we'd also like to just ask everybody, how are you doing? How are you all? Um, I don't know if it's appropriate. I can stop the um, stop the, sh the recording and you can just put a couple of words in the chat if people need any help with anything. Um, 